mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair. The HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy. And a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, and the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm going to do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. 
At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the Epoch device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today. Okay, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Perf Web 33, day one. Um, today's program, as many of our programs, are supported by generous uh, support from Levanova and Siemens Diagnostics. You see their ads, you know, check them out. They've, uh, Levanova, of course, is a leader in cardiopulmonary products, and of course, uh, Siemens Diagnostics has some uh, excellent blood gas or point of care testing, not just blood gas, mm -hmm. but it does co op, you know, if you use rapid point, it depends. So they have the Epoch and they have the Siemens rapid, the rapid point 500 or something like that. But anyway, they're really good devices. They work very well. Um, we really want to thank them again for their support. Before I get started with the introductions, however, I would like to ask all of you to do us a huge favor. And that's a huge favor. If you are watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, please do one of the following, whatever will be appropriate for that social media platform. Like, share, follow, or, and or make a comment. In fact, like, share, follow, and make comments, please. Also, for you YouTubers out there, click the thumbs up button, please, and don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to ask your colleagues to subscribe. They don't only have to be perfusionists. They can be nurses, critical care nurses. They can be physicians. They can be, you know, we have a lot of physicians come here and give a lot of lectures and they're really good lectures. Mm -hmm. And they're at, they're, they're, they're giving those lectures at a physician level. Um, so I think that a lot of physicians would actually derive benefit from these programs but you know it's free doesn't cost them anything mm -hmm. and they can turn it on if they don't like it they can tune it out right yeah. um also please go to perfusioneducation.com and leave a testimonial It'll tell you what to do there it's very simple um and i would really appreciate it if you could do that if you would like to be a presenter on our program you're a content expert or something you have a passion for and you would like to share that information um, in either a lecture format or even a discussion format, whatever it is you, you like, because there's a whole world out there of all kinds of different things and ideas. And I think, you know, that I enjoy doing this mostly because it keeps me from getting stuck in the mud. That's why I enjoy this so much. I learn so much from, I'm learning more at the end of my career mm -hmm. than I have in all the previous years I've been doing this. 
Um, but anyway, if you want to, would like to join our faculty, just send us an email at contact at perfusioneducation.com. I can see it's right there. When you see this animation, it means the phone lines are open. And if anybody calls today, I'm going to be, I'll probably fall out of this chair because nobody ever calls, but we'd really like you to. So if you just feel like doing me a solid, make the call, okay? Um, now let's get on to the introductions. In the studio with me immediately to my right is, of course, Mike Brown. Mike Brown is a native Houstonian, right? Are you a native, uh, native Houstonian? Texan. Native a Texan. native Texan, yes, excuse me, because Texas is a whole other country. Right. Um, Texas Heart Institute graduate, been a perfusionist for 38, clinical practicing perfusionist for 38 years. Mm -hmm. um, he's done some traveling in his earlier years, uh, and, but he's spent a lot of time here in Houston. But you cover 10 hospitals. Right. right. And so mm -hmm. it's almost like you're traveling in one city. Right, right. And with uh, the different uh, progression of companies that bought the companies that I was working for, uh, even within Houston, I've probably done hearts that I would say anywhere from 10 to 15 different institutions in Houston. That's a lot. That is a lot. And then coming in via Skype, we could say hello to them now. We have my good friend. You, you know him from previous programs. There he is, John Ingram. And uh, with him today is Aaron Herman, is it Herman? Is that how you pronounce it, Herman? Yes, it per is. Perfect. Okay, so John, John is a magna cum laude graduate from the University of Texas. I was, I was something loud, but I can't say it. Um, and also Texas Heart Institute, he's board certified perfusionist, currently specializing in adult perfusion, as well as pediatric and adult ECMO. Um, his hospital does a lot of ECMO, that's for sure. He has several medical patents and has served as a consultant for nearly every perfusion manufacturer. He has published seven research, uh, seven research publications in the perfusion literature and has presented both nationally and internationally. With 15 years of experience as a chief perfusionist and 30 years perfusion experience in total, he presently, that might be going up, I think it might be 31 years now, um, he presently provides nationwide temporary and long-term locum tenens coverage. So welcome, John. Good to see you again. I wish you were here, but you know what? For a one-day turnaround, I think that we need to use technology. Technology was made for this. Um, and now Aaron Herman, CCP. Aaron is a board-certified perfusionist with 12 years of experience. You travel nationally and has provided full service perfusion coverage for, to over 20 hospitals. She has been both a perfusion quality manager and a compliance officer and specializes in complex adult surgery, surgeries as well as ECMO. Erin uh, has a master's of science degree in neuroscience. Now that's impressive. Okay, I, I like that. I just wrote, I just read some of the best articles written by neuroscientists about the resident, the residence of the soul. Where does the soul reside? And uh, they, I tell you what, it was really it, fascinating, but the, three of the best articles were written by, one was a neurosurgeon, two were neuroscientists. Um, and you have taught undergraduate and graduate level courses at Kent State University and Brown Mackey College. She considers herself, or you could, Erin considers herself, a lifelong learner, I like that, and brings her passion for learning to every account. She has mastered adaptability, resourcefulness, and effective communication in diverse healthcare environments. Erin began traveling after she saw the demand for quality perfusionists expand with the recent shortage and continues to embrace the challenge of learning the vast array of approaches in perfusion. So welcome, Aaron. This is your first time on our program, and we are so happy to see you. And you look great. Your camera lighting is so much better than John's. He looks really bad. Um, we may as well, you know what, just cut John out, but you're doing great. Um, but I'm really interested Thanks. in how this is gonna transition when we get this conversation going with, your passion for learning, your passion for wanting to teach, your passion for wanting to be taught to, because you know you can't teach if you don't, if you if you can't be taught to, right? Um, 
and how that works when you go to places where you are the new guy and how they view you doing that, how they, are they receptive? Is it 50, 50, 60, 40, hundred percent? I have no idea. So it's going to be interesting to hear what you have to say about that. So John, since this was your brainchild, your brainchild, and I embraced it. I thought it was a good one. Why don't you kick us off? Hey, Joe. How's it going, Mike? And good to see you, Aaron. Um, you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. All right, awesome. So, yeah, hey, good to see you guys, Joe. Uh, thanks for all that introduction. And um, just real quick, um, yeah, I had this idea a couple months ago. I guess I called you on it, Joe. But um, the interesting thing is Aaron here, uh, she, st she started traveling through the account that you've been down here. Uh, where I'm at in Orlando and as you can imagine that is not an easy account to travel in and out of no and so um, <clears throat> They had had a lot of bad luck with travelers coming mm -hmm. into the OR there because it's I don't know how many different surgeons and how many different procedures we do do just about all, everything and they just fell in love with her uh, mm -hmm. she came in and she just Immediately they just said she's the best traveler we've ever seen come through here and these guys have been there at this account over 45 years I've had this account. That's a long um, time. So um, when I came up with this idea and started thinking of who could be involved, Aaron popped into my head one day and the rest is history. Here she is. And um, I think you're gonna really uh, find that she has a lot of, uh, brings a lot to the table with um, her experience and her professionalism and her knowledge of things. Uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be eye opening, I think. I think so. so. Uh, I think so too. Like I said, I think it's great that you. Uh, this was a really smart idea, and uh, I'm glad that Aaron. I'm, I really appreciate the fact we all do that you were willing to take time out of your busy schedule to do this. So we really appreciate you. So welcome again to both of you and John. Thank you for doing putting this together. So, you know, so so you know we could go either way. I guess this can go to horror stories, and this could go the way of uh, you know of of I guess you know. Yeah, roses. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'll start it off and start the conversation because the reason I came up with the idea is um, so many different things. But really, the first thing uh, that strikes you as a traveler, one of the first things is that we come in to hospitals and we're basically forced to use a circuit and equipment and um, a, basically a circuit and a design circuit that we've had absolutely no say so in whatsoever and we're not going to have any say so in that circuit whatsoever mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, as you know there's as many different circuits and ways of doing things as there are you know people out there doing it mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, it's just interesting that you you're there for usually a short period of time so you're not going to come in and start making changes probably the worst thing you can do and sometimes maybe more often than not an Aaron can probably speak to this that you're really forced to do things you really really wish you weren't doing and I'm not saying they're very bad or dangerous but they're awkward or uncomfortable and usually there's an element of cumbersomeness to it and um, you know sometimes it is dangerous and sometimes it makes problem solving difficult I would say almost always it makes problem solving difficult and then the other reason that I um, that I thought of this idea is what you were touching on a minute ago Joe about coming into a new place and how they treat you because I call it, you know, you know, you're not a new perfusionist, but you're new to them syndrome. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So yes. you can come in and be just the greatest thing. And I saw this happen to a guy who was 35 years experience, was a chief at a major pediatric hospital. This guy had done it all. And he came into a hospital, little account just took it over for, for a group I was with years ago. And they ended up kicking him out. They ended up firing him and all this kind of stuff because of a, something, communication with personality and some other things. And they just thought this guy was just not even qualified to do his job. Meanwhile, he was a super guy, and he still is. Um, so, um, you know, you have to prove yourself all over again. And, and imagine starting a new job, you know, every other week or something like that, where you don't know where anything is. The people don't know you. You don't know them. You don't know where, you know, all the ins and outs of the little quirks of the paperwork and what people prefer to do. And so it's it's very challenging, I think, to to be a, a traveler. Now, after a while, sometimes you can go back to the same places over and over. I think the challenge is still still there, but they get a little easier. 
So those are the two reasons that um, I kind of thought of this for people who don't go out and, you know, do this to themselves by uh, going into a new place and trying to tackle um, whatever comes. Uh, maybe there's some, some value to be learned. And I know, Mike, you've got a ton of things that you've done. So, and uh, Joe's been around forever. So right. I think we have a good group of four people here to talk about this. Mm -hmm. So, Aaron, um, what, what, what would you say you're, how would you open this up? So well, I've got, we've got John's perspective. I'm kind of curious for your perspective. I'm going to give my perspective too, but you get to be next because you're both on Skype. It's just a new rule. Okay, uh -huh. that's fine. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, wonderful. I think, John, everything he said is a valid point that you face if you're a local traveler um, like Mike there or if you're traveling nationally. I find that your power lies as a traveler in adaptability. And um, if you see something you like, kudos, you know, pick it up, embrace it, and be thankful that you had the exposure. If you see something you don't like, you can go ahead and go forward, you know, outside of that account and just know what you would never bring into your practice. Um, I think it's a privilege to be a traveler. I think a lot of people don't get the exposure and perfusion is such a diverse field. There's a thousand ways to do what we do and a lot of smart people from diverse backgrounds and I enjoy learning their approach to things and um, even seeing different surgical approaches of the surgeons. Mm -hmm. I'm to the point now I can almost tell where the surgeons have trained. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the Emory thought. Oh, that's the Texas. Right. Oh, that's the Cleveland Clinic. Oh, that's <laughs> and um, you know, you learn from all of them. And I feel that as a traveler, I bring so much to the table, even to the surgeons that are there as far as a different approach to something or how to consider or, you know, if it comes up in conversation, um, discussing with them. I think it's expanding the field. And like I said, I'm a lifetime learner and I, I just love traveling. Mm -hmm. It keeps you on your toes and it's so rewarding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's very good. That's interesting. I've, I've got a lot of, I have a ton of questions for both of you. Um, but before we get to that, how about you talk about your experience? Open this up. I think uh, that it is something that a perfusionist tends to do earlier in their career, rather as opposed to later. A lot of times people use the traveling as a place to find that final resting spot and hopefully they can find something they really like and stay there for many, many years. I know a lot of people have worked that way. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a special person that wants to be a traveler and a special person that can do it. I believe you have to be uh, knowledgeable, gregarious, communicative, and takes a lot more, to I think, to be a traveler than to be a, quote, one horse, one trick pony place. Mm -hmm. um, by looking back, and as uh, we said earlier, I've probably done cases in uh, 12 to 15 different hospitals in Houston. And I was trying to sit down last night and think of all the other places that I've been. And there's been about another 12 that I could think of that I did traveling at. And um, the things that Aaron said uh, are, are really, really true. Um, one of the great things about it uh, that I did enjoy doing it when I did it was that all the new things that I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat and you learn how to get out there and say, uh, I, I really like that. That's something I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do that and go from there. After a while, though, I, I really feel like, and I'll go back to my first statement, I think it is something that, that, that tend to be younger perfusionists that really like to do that. Um, I think as you get older, uh, you get to the point where you're saying, you know, I want to finish off my career never having harmed anybody. The medical I, creed is, you know, the first thing on there, the medical creed is, you know, do no harm. Yeah, I've come pretty close. And, uh, and I think it's a real challenge to get out there. I think it, back when I started doing traveling, uh, circuits were probably, as John alluded to earlier, a lot of different ones, but they seem to be more simplistic. We do so many more things these days as a perfusionist. And uh, so now doing it, I think it really takes 
a person who's not only knowledgeable, but has a lot of confidence in themselves. Yes, and yeah. that, yes. So those are, those are also good thoughts. And so I, I'm gonna, instead of saying there's a thousand ways to run the pump or whatever, in this case, the pump, there's actually 4,300 ways. <laughs> Yes. Because we all think our right. way is the best. Yes, we do. And there's not any two of yeah. us that are identical. No. I can just guarantee you. So I had done some traveling too. Um, some of it was just secondary to moving. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of that. And I've been to... Man, I don't even know how many hospitals I've been to, but it's a bunch. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have that adaptability today mm -hmm. at all. Um, and I think that I have some, you know, I mean, I, I think John brought it up that it's a little bit fumbly, a little, you know, unnerving. You may not be that comfortable with mm -hmm. what's going on in that location, but you have a real true emergency in front of you. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we're paid to do no harm, that's true, as our first credo, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're creating an environment where the likelihood of that occurring is much higher. Right. And even in the best of circumstances, and I've had four, four events, in fact, I think, uh, let me see, uh, go, let me go here for one second. Um, I'm doing, yes, on Thursday, March 12th, I'm going to be giving a talk, the cases I wish I could forget, learning from our mistakes. So I have four cases, four, where just by the grace of God had mm -hmm. nothing to do with my skill at all. Somehow the patient didn't die, but they really should have. Right. Four of them. I got four of them. They are indelibly impregnated into my memory. It's never leaving. Right. And so, you know, and that was under the best of circumstances. Those were places where I was comfortable. And of course, then I guess you could become too comfortable and complacent. That could be a separate issue. Right. But Aaron, I'm curious. When you go to a new place, obviously you have to be able to read the room, right? You got to be able to figure out, is this a positive vibe, a negative vibe, a hostile vibe, a depressed, sad vibe, you know, all the various different things. Who's the, who's the, who's the, the power broker in the room, in the nursing scrub, mm -hmm. you know, right. relationship. Right. Um, then you have to say something to the surgeon you've never worked with before. Right and you're gonna be doing this case, there's gonna be that first case. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully it's not the emergency case, mm -hmm. but how do, you, uh, how do you do that? How do you go from getting off of an airplane or parking your car to a place that you have no idea where to park to in the door and maybe not doing a case immediately but getting yourself prepared to do a case, maybe that next day. Uh, these are the things of nightmares. And I often have these nightmares that I show up for an assignment and in my dreams, it's two hours later and I never make it to the OR. Oh God. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause it is, it's very nerve wracking. Um, so I just keep good notes. I always travel with a notebook and write everything down. Before I go somewhere, I get a contact. I introduce myself the day before, the evening before, um, get landmarks where I need to go. And um, I have a pretty good sense of direction, which is good. I think, you know, hospitals pretty much have everything you need. Most hospitals, if I'm stuck there, I can always find a shower and a toothbrush and... <laughs> You know, a few extra sheets or something. But um, the uh, important thing is first impressions. Mm -hmm. I think it's always good to respect everybody when you walk in the room. Uh, it's not always based on who you think uh, is going to be the queen bee or the, the power person in the room. So I normally am quiet and observant 
and my hands at my side, good posture, just trying to make a good first impression. And um, I take a notebook with me everywhere and I write notes. And if someone's telling me something, I, I explain to them, wow, you're, this is wonderful stuff. I'm sorry if you don't mind, I'm gonna write this down. And I, I keep my notebook with me everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, outside of that, I just don't, you don't go in with a strong personality. I don't, mm -hmm. uh, I go in with just, I'm, I'm here to help. How can I help you? And that tends to be my token statement. I'm here to help. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they pay me to come in and stock their shelves. <laughs> you know, sometimes they come in and I'm crashing on bypass and can't find a syringe and don't know where, you know, the medications are. And, and I'm asking for all emergency su supplies. Mm -hmm. um, and once I get oriented and up and running, I keep uh, bags of things for those emergency situations. Mm -hmm. um, if I was military, it'd probably be called an old crap bag. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have whatever everybody thought thinks that their internet went down yeah you know yeah. more than likely <laughs> we're up we're back live okay so if if anybody was there that was watching please uh forgive the mishap but we had a technical difficulty and uh, we're back online now so aaron i'm sorry you were talking about how you go into the room you basically very softly just unalarming or un, un, you know, just sort of up, uh, you're there, you, you, how can I help you? They, you mentioned that sometimes they just ask you to stock their shelves, you know, they're yeah. paying you. So they want to get some work out of you. I'm assuming that's why they do that. Okay. But, uh, but then you then, talked about the crashing emergency and you have nothing and you don't know where right. anything is. So that's where you left off. Go ahead and take it from there. Yeah, so from there, um, you know, what do you do? You just, uh, that's when you rely on communication. So I've had to explain to team members that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to communicate effectively everything you say to me. I'm going to repeat back to you. If you don't hear me repeat what you're telling me, I do not hear you. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of going to be on belay here um, because in those scenarios, there's 10 people talking mm -hmm. and if they don't recognize my voice because I'm the newbie in the room, then um, I want them to understand I'm not ignoring them. I hear them or I don't hear them. Right. Well, I'm and a big I, believer I in that. I feel like that bridges a lot of gaps in those horrific situations. Yes. Well, I, I'm, I mean, I'm a big believer in that too. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, and, and I'm a pilot, so I fly. And I know a lot of people that say perfusion and flying, it's not really the same or whatever. And you're, they're right, it's not, it isn't the same. But what is, I think, what we can learn mm -hmm. from aviation, and there are several things we can learn from them. But this one is when air traffic control gives me instructions, mm -hmm. they expect me to read those instructions back to them and then they'll tell me the read back was correct. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, no, do this. So there's that two-way communication. And when you don't have, mm -hmm. when, you, when, it's, when it's assumed you heard, mm -hmm. or it's assumed they heard you, and it's not, it can be very problematic. It's, it's, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so if you haven't been able to tell, see, I can tell, I think you can too. Her personality. It's very unassuming. Mm -hmm. You, you, you're very, you smile, you know, all of that. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's really perfect for that role. Me, I walk into someplace new, look, everybody knows I'm there. All right. And, and that's just me. And so traveling for me, I think would be, it'd be hit and miss. It'd be hit and miss. If it was any place that, you know, I mean, and I'm, and I'm polarizing. You either love me or you hate me. There's nobody that just says you can take, or, take me or leave me. So that's the next problem that I have. And, and they're saying stuff back there too. And I just, I heard it. Um, but anyway, with that said, um, 
John, you wanted to, you were going to ask something? Yes. Yeah, so I, I was at an account, and this is a very substantial account. Uh, went in there, and that's, I love the circuit. I actually knew the guys from many, many years before. Very experienced perfusionist. And nice setup, simple circuit. Everything made sense. And he, I said, so, you know, so-and-so, is there anything you know, I, I, I need to know here, like, you can think of? Uh, and he says, oh, uh, well, he says, um, when, when they connect the arterial line to the cannula, he says, you're going to do it. I said, what do you mean I'm going to do it? He goes, he's going to pass it off to you, and you're going to connect the aortic cannula to the aortic line. I said... I have no idea what you're talking about. So what they do, and maybe you guys have seen this, they add about a six or about a four foot piece of free 3H tubing to the aortic cannula. They prime it up and clamp it and hand you back that clamped line. And then you have to make and figure out a way to run up your oxygenator, your arterial line, and make the connection over a top of your oxygenator. You make the air-free connection. And if it has a bubble in it, you have to disconnect it and redo it. So you're doing it by yourself. So let's say you have a centrifugal pump head. You have to figure out the perfect RPM so it slowly runs up your arterial line and connects to this. Uh, and it's a sterile connection. You have to, and almost impossible not to have some spillage down on top of the floor or on top of the oxygenator. Have you guys ever seen that? No. Well, um, no. And I yeah. would hope to, I, I, I mean, that's, I mean, who came up with that cockamamie idea? Well, well, let me tell you what Aaron made me think of this because I had forgotten about this. When she said, I can almost tell where people have been trained. Oh, that's the THI way or Cleveland Clinic way. Well, I'm not going to say, you know, what famous place this is, but apparently that is a <laughs> famous place's way of doing it that's been around a long time. Hmm. You're familiar with that, Aaron? Have you seen that? Thank goodness, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they've been doing that way for 30 or 40 years at this particular hospital, and that was something that the surgeons who trained at this place, they thought that was standard. I, I, so we would, they would pass it back to us, and we would, we would make the connection and make drips all over the oxygenator, blood on the thing, and off you would go. And, uh, yeah, I, I was wondering if you guys had ever seen that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. crazy. No. Hey, John, um, the guys are asking me, can you, can you move like an inch or two to your right and back up just a teeny little bit? How about that? That's perfect. Okay. Yes, they're giving me the thumbs up. Good. So, yeah, that's, that's crazy. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've seen some stuff. I've seen some really crazy stuff. That's, that's pretty crazy. On this one way. might, this, <laughs> this might top it. Well, the interesting thing is that these, all these surgeons have been there for a long time. The perfusionists have been there for a long time. They thought I was strange for not having son, seen this or Ooh, that, been aware of it. That so, brings up, you know, a, that brings up their, yet another point. I'm glad you said that. Way. And, uh, um, and they forget that maybe this is really not how uh, the real world does it. And I'll, I'll bring another thing up that uh, Aaron was sort of reminding me too. I went and worked at a place for three weeks. I did a three week vacation coverage. It was a single person account and it was a very small town and a very small account. I don't think they did more than about 60 cases a year. And get this, Joe, the surgeon was completely off pump. So the perfusionist did 60 cases a year. 90% of the cabbages were off pump. The only ones that were on pump were as if it was a very difficult case or it was in a crashing case from the cath lab or it was a valve. That was the only pump cases that he did the whole year. Uh, anyway, I go there for three weeks. We did one case. We did a triple valve cabbage times five. Never been what? done at that hospital before. What? Wait a minute. Six okay, hours. wait a minute. Yep. They and do, never it's, been done they at that do hospital 60 before. cases. And, uh, we were on pump six hours, five hours and uh, five minutes cross clamp. Oh, I mean, and believe it or not, the patient came off and did fine without a balloon pump. And here it is. Now, understand something. I had never used this circuit before. I'd never met a person in the room before. Because when I went there the day before he went on vacation, he took me into the OR. It was a Saturday. There was obviously nothing going on. He had a circuit set up, and he had a second backup pump. And he said, well, if you want to familiarize yourself with the pump, you can set up that second pump by looking at the first one, which is what I did. And um, 
the case came up and I called him on the phone a couple times with a couple little questions because he had a very old computer based screen that I've never seen since uh, that that kind of did certain things with his pump. But yeah, I mean that he was telling me, you know, that um, they, they don't even do anything there. And so lo and behold, they had this case. And I had uh, never met a single person in the room, never didn't know anybody's name. They didn't know me. And fortunately, you know, everything went well, but it could have easily, you know, something. Uh, we did have a little bit of a mishap. I won't go into it. It's a little hard to describe with um, when he made the connection to the arterial cannula. Blood was coming back towards the pump as if I had the clamp off or had the occlusion loose on the on the roller head. And none of those things were true. And it just turned out that he had some strange line coming off the arterial line filter that looked clamped but wasn't and ended up being um, uh, allowing blood to come back towards the pump. But anyway, once I got that figured out, um, that was just the strangest thing that happened. And um, I don't know, Aaron, have you ever had something like that happen to you? Yeah, I went in somewhere and I was told that they don't do retrocerebral they don't do dissections they don't do in here i'm doing a retrocerebral dissection with a roller pump with uh no idea what the cannulas are or whatever and um they come back the next week and they asked how it went and i told them the case i did and they looked the chief looked right in my eyes and said oh we don't do that here <laughs> and i was like well actually you do that I did that here. <laughs> like, we did that case here. He's like, oh no, we don't do that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and he insisted that you didn't do the case. He, kept he insisted, in, yeah. No, he kept not have done that. And you're like, yes, yeah. we did do that. I no, said, I, <laughs> I just did that Saturday night around midnight here at your hospital with your surgeon. And um, oh my God. he's like, well, I wouldn't even know how to do that. Like, well, wh what would you use? You know? <laughs> and so I just had to kind of come up with the game plan with the surgeon and figure it out and, you know, get everything set up and, you know, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> but again, I think that going to my earlier, you know, earlier point is that the surgeon has to be receptive to you going up to them and saying, what's our game plan here? Yes. And if they, if they look like they are deers in the headlight and they don't know what to do mm -hmm. at all because they don't do that procedure or whatever it is and you're gonna fix them to do it, I mean, where is the, where's, what, you know, this brings up yet a different question. What is our responsibility mm -hmm. when we are confronted with a situation where we think what someone else is fixing to do to the patient that we are there to help and facilitate where do we where, when are we when do we say i'm not going to do this mm. have has that john has that yeah. ever happened to you and then aaron i'll ask you the same question where i've actually said to someone i'm not doing that yeah um I have not had that happen, but I do know of a situation where there was a Jehovah Witness patient and the surgeon came up to the perfusion and said, I don't care what the, what the patient signed off on, we're giving this patient blood. The patient had gone through, signed everything possible that no matter what, he did not want blood. And the surgeon just flat said, I don't care. And they, they give the patient blood. So if I, had, if I had worked at a place like that, um, and I would tell that surgeon, I'm not doing your cases. I mean, I've, I've done things like that, where if you're going to do something that is so egregious that everybody in the room is likely to get into a lot of problem with this, I, I would tell the surgeon that you're going to have to find somebody else to pump your, your case if you're going to do that. I can't think of a case where um, I personally told a, a surgeon that I, I'm not doing that case off the top of my head. Yeah. I'll give it some thought. Aaron? You have yeah, any, I, any thoughts? I was, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just at a, a very small account going for bedside ECMO coverage. Uh, it was very long shift, uh, 20 some hours. Oh my God. Uh, and 
the um, surgeon uh, had the ECMO that I had been assigned to take care of transferred out, no big problem, but there was another patient that she felt like was trending downward and should go on ECMO mm. and was very stable, not a crash and burn case. It would have been VV and I had no badge. I had no, I didn't even know where the operating room was. I had two clamps. I had no supplies and she wanted to call somebody to bring me everything to the bedside of a new patient. And in this state I'm licensed. So, you know, I have to consider you know, is this worth my license, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, to do? Um, mm -hmm. And she wanted me to help her put another patient on ECMO. There wasn't an extra circuit primed or any supplies to do that around um, because the on-call perfusionist at the hospital was not answering the phone. Oh, the not answering the phone trick. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We all know yeah, that trick. So yes, we do. I, I just had to politely decline it and just, you know, explain to the surgeon that I would give my best and do my best and I probably could do it. However, I feel the quality of care for that patient would have been exponentially better if there happened to be a mishap uh, during the process. You know, we cannulate, then you can't flow or, you know, whoever, you know how all things yeah. can go wrong when you're fem fem cannulation. Um, that I think that they should wait and have the on-call perfusionist come in who has access to all the supplies and knows where everything is and seconds of everything and has a badge, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. So um, I, I just I just said I, I believe that the quality of care um, would not be to the level that that, that, that that patient deserved. Right, and you made that content. Now, let me ask you this. How did the surgeon respond to that? Uh, she, I mean, a, a little quiet at first, you know, um, and then kind of came around and again, this patient was not crashing and burning. Right. This patient was, the blood gases were trending downward. There was no hurry to mm. do anything and they weren't going to die of they weren't going to die of 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 anoxic brain injury right absolutely not yeah. and um so she did you know agree and i did bring up the fact that you know i'm licensed in this state and if something unplanned were to happen you know i would be torn about it if this would i would lose my license over this mm -hmm. potentially yeah, and I told her, I said, yeah, I don't think it's a risk the patient or or myself should have to take in the current situation. And she and the surgeon agreed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. I'm glad that, 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 that they did come around to understand that. And actually, you know, yeah, we say we don't want to lose our license, but really you don't want to hurt the patient. Right. That's really the issue here. The issue is not that mm -hmm. I'll lose my license. The issue is that you would lose your license because you would deserve to because you did not look out for the best interest of the patient. Mm -hmm. And we right. all have that responsibility. You, me, yeah. every you go into you go into a hospital and you're caring, you're you're doing anything. Watching an ECMO doesn't matter, inserting an ECMO, doing a case, standing by whatever it is. We, everyone in that room from the surgeon, anesthesiologist nurses, uh, surgical assistants or scrub techs, whatever, you know, the preferred term is for them, perfusionists, anesthesia tech, everybody is supposed to be a patient advocate. Mm -hmm. Everybody. And that's something that's very important. Um, and I, I mm -hmm. think in that scenario, I had already kind of proven my knowledge base because we had transported the patient to CT. It was the first time that that hospital had ever done anything like that. So with my experience, I became the expert mm -hmm. That's uh, good on the team. Yeah, that's helpful. And, and so I was able throughout the process um, that I was there for over 24 hours. They were able to see, okay, she knows what she's talking about. She probably can, but yeah, let's put the patient first here. Absolutely. Mike, you got any, uh, got any good stories? Oh yeah. There's, um, you know, we were talking about, um, 
the uh, and specifically referring to have you well let's ask the question have you ever said i'm not going to do this case because of who the surgeon was i don't think that that has ever come up uh, mm -hmm. i've been fortunate that it never has but sh should it uh, i still have a few more years left i would certainly especially at this point in my career i would say no i'm not i am not doing this because i, I do know that uh, this is not advantageous for the patient uh, and uh, I, I just I refuse I refuse to do the case mm -hmm. uh, never had before but uh, doesn't mean it still won't come up I came real close right here in town did you I mm -hmm. came real close yeah. real close and I okay. was I was um, I was counseled not to yeah because you know it would obviously be a big problem but you know, I know you know what I'm talking about, and mm -hmm. and uh, but I was like, you know, I was ready to say none of us were going to, none of us, right? And I was on the verge of doing that, and I didn't have to because, you know, something else happened, right? So it really became an inconsequential thing. So where'd they all go? Oh, there they are. Oh, <laughs> oh. So so Joe, um, on a little bit lighter note, and Aaron has this same nightmare that happened to me, and this is so simple, but not something that you would think about. Um, now, this is a hospital that I go to fairly routinely, and um, normally I'll work an ECMO shift, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and I go right in, and I know exactly where I'm going. I go right in the main lobby, first elevator, up the third floor, whatever, and I'm there. Well, one day I was running a little bit late, and I got there about, oh, three or four minutes after 8 o'clock. They lock every door in the hospital at 8 o'clock. Oh, God. And you have to go find the patient entrance to the emergency room. Oh, God. Now, I don't even know where that is. I've already parked my car, and I'm walking to try to find the other side of the building at night in the cold for the patient entrance to the emergency room. And when I get to the patient entrance to the emergency room, I don't know how to get back to where I'm supposed to go because I knew how to get in the easy way. You knew and, one You knew one way in, one way out, red know, crumbs. Of course I ask and I get there and you know, you have to survive. You learn to be survival. Survival is real quick. But you know, if, if, if that had been an emergency case that I was running in for, that probably cost me uh, five or 10 minutes, but it probably feels like a lot longer. And the stress involved, it's unnecessary mm -hmm. stress. But the, when people, bring you into an account they can't think of all the little nuances and mishaps because they have a badge and they go in through some back employee entrance they never face this right and they're not gonna face it so they right. don't think to tell you things that could go wrong you know they they tell you what you need to do you know we chart we do this we do that every four hours we do a, but nobody thinks well what if i can't even get here in the first place right and i and and here it is everybody's wondering you know where i am and everything so sometimes before you even get to your job you've already had some you know stress that you've had to deal with and um you just don't know. I mean, I would have never thought they locked the door at eight o'clock. I think nine o'clock or ten, but I guess some places are gotten earlier, and uh, just completely threw me for a loop. You know, I was no problem coming to that hospital all all those times before that. That's that's that that is horrible. So um so, you know, John, you brought this up, and uh, I wanted to sort of go a little farther with it, and that is thinking that the, the people that were doing that with the arterial line, like connecting the line to the cannula. And they thought you were strange because you had never seen or heard of that. And so it kind of, for me at least, brought up some thoughts of how deep in silos are we? And how can somebody, and I'm assuming they were seasoned perfusionists, right, Aaron? Um, yeah, they've been, they've been practicing for a while. How do they not know that that's not common? I mean, if you, I guess if you finish school, go to one place, stay mm -hmm. there for the entirety of your career, mm -hmm. never go anywhere else. I call that institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Institutionalized, yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's and That's the way we've always done it. We've right, it. exactly. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, it. it's one of my favorite sayings. Do you know, there's a saying, and anybody out there, if you know it, say it. You'll win a prize if you know it. You get a cup, <laughs> perf, perf whip cup. These are valuable, they're collector's items. 
Um, there's one phrase that answers all unanswered questions in the universe. Do you know what it is? That's just the way we do it. It's just the way it is. You were close. That's the way it is. You were close, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a perf web cup because that was close. Okay. The way it, it's just the way it is. Yeah. It's the way it is. The way it is. Mm -hmm. That answers everything. Why do you do that? The way it is. That's it. it makes it easy. Yeah. Makes it real easy. It solves every problem that there ever was. <laughs> so, so that's something that concerns me that we have a profession of which there are, we are, we are one of the smallest fraternities out mm -hmm. there. 4,300 plus or minus, give or take. Mm -hmm. That is not a lot of people. Now we're not as, we're not quite as small as let's say astronauts or astronauts that went to the moon. That's a smaller group, mm -hmm. but we're still a pretty small group for a medical mm -hmm. profession, for a profession, mm -hmm. a dedicated profession at that. How do we not, I guess, expect or that people don't feel the responsibility to make sure that they learn other techniques so that they can always reflect and see if they're, what they're doing is the right thing. That what, what can I do better? And maybe you can't do any, maybe, maybe you don't see anything that looks better. You say, nah, I like my way better, but you don't know what you don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And there's no way to know that. And so I think that's something I wonder if that shouldn't be required. And I had one more question too is, and this is very important. Um, should it be required? John and Aaron and Mike, you're on, you're doing per diem. You're doing locums. That's what you do. And they're leaving on Monday. So you get in on Saturday and they don't want to pay you until Monday because they're leaving Monday. <clears throat> so they show you some stuff on Saturday, Monday morning, they're gone. You go in there, do the case, no formal introductions, no orientation, no, you know, getting your bearings, where is everything and all that kind of thing, never doing a case and you're just left. Assuming that, you know, you, you'll do fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been here all this time, but I'm, you know, I've worked here for 20 years. It's easy mm -hmm. unless you're the first time there. Mm -hmm. So should it be required for locums to have in these agreements, these hospitals that hire people like you guys, that they have to bring you in a day before so you'd come in on Thursday, they would have to pay you for, for Friday or whatever day it is that you, even if you have to fly there and fly back and then wait to go back, but at least you've gotten some level of orientation. Should that be a requirement, a standard of care? Or let's put it that way, a standard. I think of the way the current state is, is uh if you're the traveler and you 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 insist on that rule i don't know that there's any rule out there that anybody's going by but if you're the traveler and you insist on that rule then it could be um whether or not you go there or not i think most places when you pump cases they they want to do that uh but you know there's so many small accounts out there that do one case a week there's a lot of accounts that only do 50 to 80 a year and you might go there and they might not do a case for a week or two well that guy's going the guy or girl is going on vacation in a couple days so they just show you everything they can show you and then you hope that you know you have their cell number it's kind of the way it works out if it's a busy place and they're doing cases i think they always try to get you to watch maybe even more than one if they can and uh, get your hands on it a little bit with somebody there as well until they put you on your own. But if you're taken over and it's a one person account, um, yeah, I mean, you just, just might not have that luxury. Uh, yeah, I think, well, yeah. So, you know, of course I'm assuming the hospitals would be 
somewhat resistant because that's going to cost them more money. You know, I don't know. Aaron, what do you think? Aaron? Okay, sorry, you guys. Um, I, uh, I guess I can start with the second question about um, being brought in one day before mm -hmm. or a little bit before. Um, I think that the norm is for you to be oriented. Mm -hmm. um, even if it is a quick orientation, I think the camaraderie in our small niche, I think most people don't want to burn you. And I think if it's a one person account, and I've been to uh, several of those, um, they're nervous about leaving. This is their baby and they're tied here 24 seven on call. And they don't want something bad to happen when they leave because then the, they can never leave. Yeah, that makes you know? sense. They'll I mean, never that, of course, get out that of makes there. Sense. So, um, I find that for the last three years, I have been brought in a day ahead of time, two days ahead of time, and, you know, had a chance to put my hands on everything and look at everything. I have a lot more experience with that than I do those nightmare things where you're coming in and crashing on bypass, you know, and never been to the place. That, that has happened, but mm -hmm. that is my exception mm -hmm. yeah. um, in I, my experience mm -hmm. you know th there's fewer of those experiences than i have of actually good experiences of coming in and getting a decent orientation and i offer to people if they don't have anything in writing i'll talk with the person and i'll type up something mm -hmm. case logistics you know how do they expect you to hand off um what does anesthesia expect you to do for autologous donation what is expected of point of care testing and i t i write it all up um beforehand and i'll ask them to review it when they leave if they don't have anything like that and then i leave it for them mm -hmm. so i can make the next traveler going in and out of there their role easier mm -hmm. i try to strengthen that camaraderie and you know use use that lifetime learning mm -hmm. to help the next person that comes along because there are times you go go in somewhere and there's nothing written down. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, okay, so um, let's do this. So I've been asked if we could take, can we take a five minute break? So everybody that's, uh, that's out there, we're gonna take five minutes. Um, I think they're gonna probably kill our mics. So uh, uh, you guys can take a break too, and then we'll pick this back up again and, uh, and go from there. But I just want to say very quickly, I'm glad you said everything you just said, Aaron, because it's, it, at first I was sort of like, man, this sounds just crazy. I don't know, you know, yeah. if doing that makes sense. But you're saying that it's really pretty structured. It, yeah, you, if you allow it to be, and you make it be it, I feel like it can be pretty structured, yes. I like that. Okay, five minutes. We'll be right back in five minutes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. 
An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Okay, and welcome back, everybody. We have Aaron and uh, John still still with us. Mm -hmm. Let's see where'd they go. There they are. Hey, hey, guys. Okay, so no, that was very that was really rewarding to hear, Aaron, because I come from a time the traveling that I did was years and years ago, mm -hmm. and um, we were cowboys. It, it was we would do that, but. I also think that when we did that back then, the, everything was not nearly as complex mm -hmm. as it has become. The whole thing has, I mean, it was a, I mean, it was pretty simple. 
Mm -hmm. It was blood in, blood out, and that was it. Blue blood to red. And, and we didn't have all this other stuff. You know, it was mm -hmm. one way of giving cardioplegia if you gave it at all. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, uh, just a venous line, arterial line. You do this, you do that, and you're done. Mm -hmm. And that was it. So it was a different environment. But now with the complexity of everything and the point of care lab testing and the required documentation and the, you know, just the stuff that you have to do and the pumps are, you know, they're, they're computerized. I mean, we had an on and an off switch mm -hmm. forward and forward and reverse. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was it. It was very simple. Uh, but you were saying that in your, your, your experiences, you were saying about um, how it's been for you and you had one place that had everything you met with them and stuff. You want to tell that story? Uh, during the break, I was speaking to Joe and I, of the 12 or so places that I did uh, relief work in, uh, it ran the gamut as to the information you received on how to run a, an appropriate case in that institution. Uh, went from anything from, oh, this, it's real easy, it's yada, 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 and you can just get it done real easily, where I had to ask most of the questions to make sure I felt comfortable with what I was going to be doing. Whereas at the other extreme, uh, there was a lady that I relieved who had everything scripted out like a Hollywood movie. It was amazing. She had all the physician preference lists, what they did. Uh, if she mentioned arterial cannula, she would tell you the words that he would use to have you run up the volume and mm -hmm. make the connection. And it was like a 10 page script for her normal straightforward cab. And of course, I was so appreciative of that. I told her uh, that everybody should adopt that, that she should make that as a, quote, uh, generic script for uh, any company that wanted to come in and give her a break. Because I felt like uh, a perfusion student could have walked in all day one, graduate perfusion student, and could have done her case because it was so well lined out. Mm -hmm. That's wow. nice. That's nice to hear too. That's nice to hear too. I'm, I'm, I'm very disorganized mm. and I, no one would ever want to come relieve me. But you know, that of course brings up, you know, other questions. Should there be solo perfusion accounts? Should, should that even be permissible? Um, well, that kind of ties yeah. back into the first question before the break. You um, were talking about really how independent we are. And, um, you know, if, if you remember your the first question, I forget exactly your words, but um, pretty much, you know, we do so much on our own. Should we know what other people are doing at other oh, institutions yeah. as right, far as exactly. cannulation techniques and... Um, and I think that as I've found through my travels, and I've only been doing this 12 years, so I really pale in comparison to you guys. Um, and I, I appreciate your all your years. I feel like um, you're considered strong when you don't need help in our field. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good. Now that's and, a, that's a good point. That's that's wrong wrong headed, but true. And I run into that culture a lot when I'm on the road. Um, and it's even in new grads, I see it. Um, and it's in people who are nearing retirement. And I think because we're so independent and all of our responsibilities and roles, we have a very small niche and we're great technicians, um, that it's hard for us sometimes to take the help. I always take help. If I'm at an account and someone wants to be in the room with me, I get excited about that because I'm always alone. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always doing things alone. You know, um, there are several accounts I go to where two perfusionists are assigned per case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there, that's a bit much. John, you were going to say something? There's three states. I don't know the exact states, but I've been told by someone who, who would definitely know recently. There's three states that it's required to have two, two perfusions on, on the pump. Mm -hmm. um, and I could see why people could think that that is an insane thing to do, is to, to, be, at the, to be the only perfusionist at your account. And I, I know some very powerful, wise people in our field, Joe, that have been around forever and kind of the leaders of our field. Uh, some of them are 
would be very, very opposed to ever being the only perfusionist at, at your account. And a funny thing is, I've actually done that probably about 15 or 16 years of my career here and there. I was the only perfusionist at my account. And, and I suppose uh, it, it's pretty lucky that, you know, but I had many, many instances where I was either ill or uh, was stuck in the room for eight or 12 hours and you can't get a drink of water, food, or go to the bathroom. And there is nobody to call. You know, there is nobody to call. And um, I can see why people could make that argument. But I wanted to say about a, a, a circuit uh, situation that I had to pump a case that it was dangerous and they were not going to change it. And I wanted to, not, not to shift gears too much, but it's a, a one that occurred to me while you guys were talking earlier. Have you guys ever seen where when the case is over and you're off pump, the instant, the very second they're pulling the cannulas out of the heart, the surgeon has them in his hand, connected to your tubing, and hands them to you, passes them off the table. Oh, I've got a great story for you. Yes, I have seen that yeah, happen. I've seen it. And, I've seen uh, yep, I've seen mm -hmm. it happen. So okay, great, great question. This, this place I went, I mean, I had never seen this before. I mean, the, the case is literally minutes you're off pump. And the venous cannula comes out, that's fine, give a little volume, and then bam, he's handing you, the surgeon hands you the lines, and you better have a way to grab them, because he's handing them to you. Mm -hmm. Now, you haven't even gotten the, all the blood out of your circuit mm -hmm. over to the cell saver yet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you've got the tips of the cannula in a red bag while you're trying to get the circuit blood to the cell saver. And, you know, if the patient crashes, so this place had been doing this for many decades, and the perfusions had been there. And I asked him one day, I said, haven't you ever had a problem with this where the patient, you had to go back on pump? But he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, one day I had to do it three times. I had to set up the circuit and go back on three times. And I thought to myself, and I guess, oh, you, still, no. and I guess you still didn't learn because <laughs> yeah, you're still doing it. I mean, but, um, why you know, would... that's, an, that's a good Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, it's scary because you're new. I cannot tear this circuit down, set it up dry, and prime it nearly as quickly as you can. Right. Because yeah. you've done it 5,000 times. I've done it two times. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You guys have all seen that. Did you do anything about it? I mean, we well, just had I'll to tell live you, with it, right? I'll tell you the story. Um, and I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Let me think about it for a minute. Um, oh, man. He was the author of the Sugar Busters book, or one of the authors of that book. I can't remember his name to save my life, though. But anyway, so it was in New Orleans, and uh, I had just changed jobs from one company that was covering a university hospital mm -hmm. and went over to the company that was covering Tulane mm -hmm. that also had these other accounts in the city. So I was sent over there and there was somebody else there. So I wasn't even going to be by myself. And um, man, I wish I could remember that guy's name. But anyway, um, so the guy that was over there, though, was really, really, really weak. In fact, he's not even a perfusionist anymore. He was really, really, really weak. Um, and uh, so I, he, I was going to do the case. So I went on pump, did the case come off pump, same thing happened. The come was off pump and, you know, I was just sort of trying to get my bearings and I can see this hand and a line in it shaking it at me like this. And I, you know, I was kind of clamped, so I was crouched down and I, I looked up and I said, you know, what do you want me to do? And he said, take the line so i'm like okay so i grabbed the clamp off the thing you know the 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 mm -hmm. mast yeah. opened it up took it he let it go whipped around and i put it up here the next thing i know here comes the other line so i'm like well, this is a new one on me okay <laughs> this just doesn't make any sense at all yeah. And I'm just in, I'm, I, this had never happened to me before. And I was, and I was about, I was probably a 20, I'd probably been doing this for about 25 years at the time. So I, I had some years on me and I'd never seen it. I'd been a lot of places. So I took that line too and hooked it up on the, on the thing. 
the other guy had mm -hmm. wandered off. So I'm there by myself. Okay, keep that in mind. So I'm like, that was the strangest little event that I think I've ever seen. And this guy was just so nasty. I mean, he was mean, mm -hmm. but only to me. Uh, Not yeah, everybody yeah. else in the room. Mm. Everybody else in the room were wonderful. I was being treated like a like a, a, a dog with mange. You were the whipping boy. Bad, yeah. big, big time, big time. So mm -hmm. the case gets done and I waited and he came and he walked, was walking to get ready to walk out and I kind of got in his way and I put my hand out and I said, you know, it was very nice having met you. You know, I wish you the best of luck in the future. And he's just standing there looking at me <laughs> Not shaking my hand. I've got my hand out, but he's not shaking it. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? I said, I want to say that pleasure to have met you. And I wish you the best of luck in the future. He says, I don't, I, what, what are you talking about? We have another case. And I said, no, you have another case. I am never doing another <laughs> case for you or in this hospital ever again. I'm leaving. Best of luck to you. And he just blew past me and stormed out the door. I never went back. Hmm. I left. Yeah. And I didn't only just leave. I, when I walked out, I finally saw the guy. And I was like, dude, that pump needs to be torn down. He goes, oh, well, I'll help you. I said, no, you don't understand. I'm leaving. <laughs> I quit. Okay, I quit. You understand? Quit. You go clean that mess up. Set it back up. You have another case. I don't. Bye. Hmm. And the company didn't fire me. I didn't actually have to quit. They didn't fire me because they were so desperate for people. And I was like scraping the bottom yeah. of the barrel. But, uh, but yeah, so that was my experience. And it was, uh, it was I just, I, I, it's killing me that I can't remember the guy's name. Well, well I have a question for you guys. Um, in that case, it sounds like you've all seen it. What is the mindset? Where is the advantage? In other words, when you do something, any technique at all, I would think that you have a mindset that, hey, this is a good idea because. But yes, I, haven't found I, I it agree with, with you. Why would you do that? Why would you? Why are you doing it? Like, what is this better than what you were doing when you didn't do this? When you left the lines up until, you know, a reasonable amount of time? How did this suddenly become, you know, more, more intelligent than the counter? I don't know, dude. You know, <laughs> I don't know. People, I, you know. I have traveled around a lot and I have seen, I've seen some strange, mm -hmm. you know, ways of doing things. Like uh, I was at one hospital where it was with, I had this company and, um, and they needed some emergency help. They were, they had a big mess on their hands. And uh, I went up there and uh, that's when we had Brent and uh, uh, Brent went up there and uh, yeah. the other guy, Mark, right. and he went up there and they had this pump, the way their pump was set up, they had all of these lines that were connected, like research lines that you had to access mm. in various different times, the way they did their cases, but they were all on the other side of the pump and there was no way to access it yeah. without going on the other side of the pump to do it. And I'm like, of course, I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, thank God I don't have to be here to do these cases. I was leaving two other people to do it because I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't, this is, doesn't look, this does not look good. Mm -hmm. And, but that's, and this was a big place. This wasn't some little place, mm -hmm. big. Lots and lots and lots of cases. And they just had the craziest pump circuit I've ever seen, mm -hmm. you know? And to your point, John, what is the advantage of getting rid of the lines other than putting the patient at increased risk? Did you ever say anything like, why do you do this? Did you ask? I, I asked the, the chief, I said, haven't you ever had a problem doing this? Right, and he did and three he times. Told me, well, yeah, one day and I, but as far as why, you know, oh, that's, that's the surgeons were trained that way at the 
blah blah place that they trained. Mm -hmm. that's, and there was that's... so you didn't did you not feel comfortable to go up to them and say, "Why do you do this? This is this is the the upside. The downside to what you're doing is this. The upside is that." Yeah, I think as a traveler, you walk a very fine line. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron probably has seen this more than me. Yep. There are travelers out there. The, the ones that succeed have to be chameleons. You mm -hmm. unfortunately have to do, like I said, when I opened up the conversation, a, a lot of things that you just wish you weren't doing. And then if you go in, and there are people who do this, they go in and they start, you shouldn't be doing this, and I'm not doing that, and you, I'm going to do it this way. And, you know... That's kind of professional suicide as a traveler, I think. I don't know how you ever get called back. And after a while, I don't know who's going to call you. Uh, but there are people that do that, right, Aaron? You've seen that? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the outcome eventually? <laughs> well, yeah, they, they're not asked back. So they just keep on their journey, but they're not going back. To, they're always at a new place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we had one come through where I'm at. Uh, about last year, a year ago, and they just fired her over a text. They what? just texted her, don't come back. Oh, the yeah. uh, the traveler. Yeah, yeah, because she yeah. was helping out, and they just they just texted her. They didn't even bother, you know, sitting down and talking with her. That um, she made a huge, gigantic scene, and it was for no reason whatsoever that I could figure out or anybody else could figure out. But she thought it was important, and they just texted her and said, "We don't need you anymore. Don't come back." Wow. So, I, I mean, that's one place I know she's not coming. And I have a feeling that's probably happened a lot, a lot of places. But, yeah, I mean, that's that's one reason why I brought this topic to you, Joe. Um, you're doing things where you have no say so in the design of the circuit, no say so in the technique. Now, once you're there a while, if you're there for a week or two or three and you gain their respect, you can mm. kind of start approaching things and maybe you can tailor a couple little things while you're doing a case that make you a little comfortable, a little more comfortable, you know what I mean? And once they're not watching you as close, you can kind of say, well, I'm kind of going to leave this stopcock open, even mm -hmm. though you guys leave it closed and, you know, different little things that are more like style, but at least it makes you feel a little more comfortable. You can get away with, I think, after a little bit of time. But when you first come in and you start wanting to change stuff, um, yeah, I don't think you can do that either, John. I'm with you. I tried my best when I went out there to mimic exactly the way that they did it. And for me to adapt to them, not them yeah. to adapt to me. Um, and that's why I was so insistent on knowing how things were, were done uh, so that I could. Uh, I wanted that surgeon to feel like um, their profuseness never left them, that they're yes. doing it the same way and they feel comfortable with it. And I guess I did pretty good because of the 12 places I went. I think the day I was leaving, the surgeon turned around and goes, would you like to have a job here? So, I, you know, and uh, I was flattered. And I said, well, no, I think my wife would not want to. <laughs> I didn't say that. My, my, my wife would not want to live here. But uh, uh, I was really flattered that they, they thought that much of it and said, I think you and the other professionals would get along. I'd love to have you come work here. So I thought that was that, that was good. But. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, John. I, I, I think that's the way you do it. You, did, you just have to uh, mimic them and, and, and follow them as close as you possibly can. And then as, you, as time goes on and you can put your signature on a few things. And, uh, you know, doing the way they did it is how you learn some things, especially me as a young perfusionist out there doing relief work when I was young. That's how I learned to do things a different way. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And see, that goes back to that original point that I had is that if you're institutionalized, as Aaron calls it, yeah. then you don't know right. what you don't know, That's right? That's right. You do that traveling oh, yeah. and it gives you an edge it does. later in your career because you learn things from other people. Right. And that's going full circle right back to the very beginning of this program of how do we encourage or, 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 or create an environment by which people would be more aware or more informed 
mm -hmm. about other ways of doing things. And even though, John, I agree with you that, and I agree with you too, Mike, I mean, I agree with Aaron, I agree with everybody on this, that when you go to somebody else's account, you're not there to change their account. Right. You're there to do, you know, to, to basically act like you'd been there for 20 years. Right. That's the goal and that's how everybody ends up liking you, getting along, calling you back, et cetera. But if, I mean, we all know that if you hand me those lines <clears throat> at this point, this is not a good idea because right. if something happens, you know, it's not in the best interest of the patient. So yes, you want to keep your business. Yes. You want to not create problems, but in that circumstance, in some politically sensitive way, is there not something that you should have said? Mm. And I, I, I guess I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of being a little bit, pro, being a bit of a provocateur with you, um, but should you have said anything? My first thing is to go to the chief in a calm way and try to talk about, you know, I see you guys do this and I'm just trying to learn and I see that you hand the lines off like five seconds after we come off. Well, um, you know, uh, you know, like I, you know, I try to explore a conversation and then maybe you can find out that, oh, you know, well, if, if you don't want to do it that way, then then just tell them and they, they won't pass it. I mean, sometimes you strike up on something that you find out you can solve easily. Um, but most of the time that that's not going to be the case. Um, mm -hmm. But how would you ha handle that, Aaron? I don't go barking to the surgeon and to the anesthesiologist. The first thing I do is either talk to a, a staff perfusionist who I can confide in and then if I, if, or go directly to the to the chief and just try to see what I can understand about, you know, what why you guys do a certain way. Oh, gosh, this is where our profession becomes a dance, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, you got to learn the dance. And I think that it's different everywhere you go. Uh, who you feel like you can have an intellectual conversation with who you will not offend. Um, and probably before I would take the lines, I'd look up at the patient. Is there a swan in? What's the pressures? You know, ask anesthesia. Everywhere I go, I always ask if I can break down the pump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I probably would have asked as they were handing them to me, does this mean you want, I'm going to break down the pump now, if that's okay with you. And if they hesitate, then I think the point would be proven and I would have asked it in a professional way and mm -hmm. put it on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I tell everyone everywhere I go, I take orders. Mm -hmm. I, I take orders and so if you're, you're good with this, this is what I'm gonna do, you know, and go from there. But it's a dance. You don't ever know where you're going into, mm -hmm. who's, mm -hmm. who holds the power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, gotta, you gotta learn the dance mm -hmm. and uh, take the lead Mm -hmm. And I've learned to ask questions where it throws it back on them. Mm -hmm. And if they give the command, then okay. Mm -hmm. Have you considered running for office? <laughs> I'm, I am the least no, political person that. you'll ever meet. <laughs> that, that may be something you need to do. You need to at least consider it. Um, no. And that's probably why no. you're a successful, you and John are both successful at going out and you were successful when you did it and I was not, <laughs> okay? Because that's yeah. just not me, it's not my person. I no. do not, I know, even though I did it, I did it unsuccessfully, but I did do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, uh, I don't have the right personality for it. I don't, I cannot do what, what you're doing. Not, that's not in my DNA. I would be like, look guys, I, I would be, John, I would have told him, you really need to keep those up there. Mm -hmm. If you hand those back to me and something goes wrong, the air bubble decides to go down the, 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 your, your brand new LED graft for whatever reason, and we have to crash back on, I can't put this back together again. Mm -hmm. So you just got to keep them. That's yeah, that's and as you I know, this, with the guy that was flicking the line at you and the guy that he has both hands handing me the arterial and venous I know, line. it catches you off guard. Basically, 
the surgery has come to a stop until you take those lines from that surgeon. Yeah. Right? In other words, he's not doing anything. He, the surgery has come to a stop, and he's waiting on you to take those lines from his hands so he can go back and do what he's doing. So, yeah, I mean, are you going to have a big debate? I will tell you one thing I did many years ago. This is not as a traveler. This is the account that I worked at, and they opened up the account to all the surgeons in town could come through. So we had one surgeon, one perfusionist, me, and all of a sudden, six to seven different surgeons from all around the big city I was working in could all come through. And this one surgeon came through, and he was really old school. And at the hospital he was at, they'd been doing it since the 60s or 50s, and he had the same perfusionists that were OJT. He'd still been working with them 40-some years. So he comes over to, to, to this hospital, to where I'm at, and... He is the kind of guy that turns around and tells the perfusionist every single knob to turn, when to turn it, how much to turn it. I mean, literally tells the perfusionist every single thing to move. So, and I wasn't prepared for this. And so he was doing me, this to me during the case. And about halfway through the case, I stood up and I said to him, Dr. So-and-so, I went to school for this. I went to school for this. You do not have to tell me every knob to turn. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I have stood my ground many times, but that is, you know, I was the chief. That was my account. You know, I had tremendous confidence in the fact that I wasn't going to probably lose my job because of this new surgeon that came in and thought, you know, he had to do everything his way. And um, you, you can't, I don't think you can do that. <laughs> you got to take your, pick your time and pick your mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, make pick sure your battles. That, you you know, got to pick yeah. You got to pick and your battles. That's not going to happen in a two-week travel assignment. No, you know? it's probably not. You're absolutely right. Okay, so let's do this if we could. Um, how about if we take another short break, and I want to come back, and when we come back, I want to talk about where you see the current um, number of perfusionists, the, 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 we'll call it the shortage, We'll just use the term. I don't like to use that term, but we'll use the, the how about we use the um, reduced, reduced asset level. How about that? Reduced asset level. I like that one. Um, and where if you're seeing it getting worse, stabilizing or getting better. So that's that's what I'd like to talk to you about moving forward. So that and then also want to talk to you about people who may watch this program that are thinking about doing what you do and how would a person who's never done it before get started. So those are the two topics that I'd like to address with you guys when we come back from our short break, if that's okay with y'all. You don't mind sticking around? Thanks. No. You're good, John? Yes. Uh, and John, yeah. John yeah. You, you have a leaning issue, so you still keep <laughs> leaning left Oh, okay. There you go. There you go. There you go. He hasn't slept in days. <laughs> uh, uh, do you have a vi anybody got a violin? <laughs> Come on, John. It looks uh, good. I'm seeing myself in the middle. So okay, you guys must. Yeah, see right you there. Up. Yeah, we we have the screen split up. So so about half about as the program goes on, you just keep drifting to the left, and then you're in. You unfortunately you're not actually in the frame with Aaron, which would be pretty cool if that actually happened. But what happens is just half your face gets cut off. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, and you look really, you look very ominous that way. So, he looks, he looks like a, no, don't say that. You can't say that. Um, not on the air. So, anyway, with that said, we're going to be back in five minutes. So, uh, refresh your drinks. Get your phones. Call in. Phone lines are open, I think. Call in. Somebody call in. If anybody calls in. Mike is going to get you a vacation to Barbados. Anybody that calls in, okay? And a Perf Web Cup. So, five minutes. We'll be right back. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. 
You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary as we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community. The need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedure. So it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay they will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. And you're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the Wrap Venous Cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. 
the high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Okay, and welcome back everybody. Um, we got, we got uh, Aaron and John back too. There they are, hey guys. Okay, so I'd like to take, if we could, maybe the last 15 or 20 minutes to talk about, you know, where you guys are seeing the number of available perfusionists, you know, either getting worse in terms of, you know, having too few or getting better and where you think that pendulum may be as it inevitably will start to swing back. That's sort of the way the cycle works. You've seen this before, right? You've oh, seen, gosh, yeah. you and I have both, now Aaron, you probably have, John, I know you've seen it. I've seen where there's been this kind of a shortage before, it was years ago, mm -hmm. but then the pendulum swung the other direction and there was a glut. Mm -hmm. There were perfusionists that, that couldn't find, couldn't, couldn't get a job. Uh, there were gra people graduating from perfusion school could never get a job mm -hmm. and uh, there was just so few and of course you know it has an effect on salaries it has an effect on all kinds of things um, but now the pendulum seems to have swung back the other direction and i believe that how far it goes the either way is dependent on how far it goes out so for example in our current situation if the pendulum swung way up here and it was that much of a shortage that when the pendulum comes all the way back, it's that, uh, that momentum is going to carry it. And I can see where we may end up at a glut again, but there's other things too, that you can, you know, there's challenges. Like how do we, how do we adapt? How do we, what can, kind of technology should we bring into our business? um into our practices and stuff like that how do we you know you, you look at a heart surgeon i know heart surgeons that amputate legs and feet mm -hmm. because of whatever the reason may be you know they'll do chest work they'll do you know vascular work they'll do endovascular work they'll do this they'll do that they're doing a lot of stuff we are so pigeonholed and i think that to survive this industry we need to sort of get branching out a little bit and start looking at other things, other technologies that are extracorporeal in nature, requiring blood and pumps and pressures and all the stuff that we do, that we can add value to the facilities where we may work. That's what I think. Um, but what that is, I don't know. Like Angiovac, I think is great. I think mm -hmm. Angiovac is a great way to, to build a more robust caseload so that when heart caseload is down you still have that mm -hmm. because that's that's how you're going to survive diversity is what makes you survive if you're if you're just one thing this is all i do this is all i ever done and 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 that goes away or reduces and you don't survive so either why don't we go with aaron first so tell us about where you think the current staffing situation is i wanted mike to go first. <laughs> I, uh, that's a hard question. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear um, you. I have started to see that pendulum swing. Um, so the laws of supply and demand, um, right now we're in high demand because of low supply. And I'm 
I'm feeling the supp- the supply is increasing. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling um, positions are starting to fill in. Um, and I have just been feeling that probably the last four months, five months, maybe all the new grads from, you know, the last graduation are kind of up and running and mm-hmm. they don't need cross coverage while they're getting trained and they're taking their own call. And, um, I, I'm feeling a little bit of that pendulum swing, honestly. Mm-hmm. How is that going to affect you know, cause you're young. I mean, you're, you're comparatively very young. Um, yeah. how, what are you, how are you planning your life to go transition from what you're doing to something else before there is not something else? Well, I think I entered the field where new grads couldn't get jobs. There you were did? very little job openings and you could just go. I was an 08 a graduate and you just, there were no jobs mm-hmm. and it was hard to get jobs. But even when you got a job, there's, they, there still were travelers because mm-hmm. you couldn't cross cover for vacations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always so, going to be a one man account, even though I don't think there should be. Yeah, or even if it's a three man account and they've got three surgeons because mm-hmm. they're not in a plus one model mm-hmm. and someone wants to take a vacation, they still have to have three available mm-hmm. you know, in case, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, an issue arises. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I just am, I've looked at settling down somewhere. Uh, I've got kids who are teenagers and a great home life where my husband works from home and my in-laws live next door to me. And so right now I'm not going to do anything to, to destabilize their roots and their Mm -hmm. future. So, you know, hopefully I can just keep traveling, Mm -hmm. but I see a lot of people are branching out with BMAX and PRPs, PRP facials, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. outside of the open heart realm. I'm mm-hmm. um, doing podiatry with BMAX, PRP facials, and, you know, picking up that business. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, we're doing some plastic surgeon work, too. Yes. And, uh, you know, regardless of what you think about it, I still think it's smart to have it as a service that you will provide. I, you know, I mean, I, I question whether it has any real clinical value, but that's a different topic for a different day. Mm-hmm. If, so, if they, if, it's not going to hurt anybody. So I'm comfortable with that. It can't hurt anybody. And it, maybe it does do some good. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. John, what are you seeing in the, in the, uh, in the market? What do, what do you see the market trends at this point? Yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to tell because I'm focused totally on ECMO right now, which, um, ECMO is growing, as we all know, and right now in the winter time, the flu season just wreaks havoc. I probably get several calls a day, and I, I obviously can't take them. Um, so that part <clears throat> probably is going to continue to grow, but um, it's hard to say. I've always thought in, in the years I've been doing it that it's very fragile, the difference between too many perfusionists and too few, right? It's pretty fragile. And, and you have a lot of schools right now that are graduating some pretty large classes of students. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I know people are predicting five years, 10 years, the shortage is going to stay. I really don't know because it, it's of such a small field. It doesn't take a whole lot for it to swing back one way or the other. But having said that, I think, you know, if we all want our salaries to continue to go up, we need something of a shortage, right? We need people who want us. So to embrace all these technologies, or at least a number of them, like HIPEC, Angiovac, and I've been places where it was PRP and BMAC, and even some other things, um, we can embrace these technologies and expand our field. And um, I guess we can always sort of let them go if we really have to. Like we've been trying to let go of ECMO for 35 years. It still hasn't worked. You know, it's working a little with ECMO specialists, but by and large, most places can't seem to get an ECMO specialist program totally off the ground either. Um, So 
from my standpoint, I like I like the shortage. It keeps people calling me. It keeps driving up salaries. But if you're set at an account and you're constantly short, you can't go on vacation, go to meetings. The shortage gets old. Mm. You know, so mm-hmm. there's definitely two sides. To it. But but one thing Aaron was saying, for example, if you go to a three-person account, my very first job, for example, three-person account, the two guys that I was that that were there before me had been there for decades, and they had six weeks vacation. I came in new, and my my vacation was three weeks. But even that is 15 weeks out of the year. You're down to two people. Mm-hmm. Even mm-hmm. and so that happens. A lot. That happens everywhere. Everywhere. Every, like a, Aaron knows in Orlando, I think we have 15 perfusionists. There's two on vacation every week, and that doesn't include somebody that might be sick or or has to go out of town for some other reason. So you always have that um, element to it. Um, so you know, there's nobody out there that says. I don't think there's a single account out there that says, well, when somebody goes on vacation, we're perfectly still fine with all the people we have. And I don't see that too often. So the vacation thing uh, adds up, you know, because you add up everybody in the group. Joe, you probably have this in your situation. You probably always have two or three people on vacation. And you- no, we have, uh, no, our, our, our rule is to have two I think it's two two people can be off right now because we've grown enough. It was, of course, we were smaller. And so it really wasn't, you know, a, a burdensome to say one perfusionist off at a time. But as we continue to grow and our volume grows, then now we can have two perfusionists off and one auto transfusionist or two auto transfusionists and one uh, perfusionist. So three people technically, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, plus we have, uh, we have several, we have a couple of, at least two uh, couples that work for us. So we don't have mm-hmm. a, uh, a, uh, an anti, what is that called? Anti, it's not, is it nepotism? Is that the term? Anti-nepotism uh, rule where you can't have a couple married, couple uh, working in the same place. But we don't have that issue. We, we do that. We embrace that um, and don't have a problem with it. But it creates challenges because they want to go on vacation together. And so, you know, that and if you have two married couples and both want to go on vacation together, it's not two people you're losing. It's four. Mm-hmm. So. Can, can you just tell me one thing you guys hit on earlier uh, on, on the positive side of being a traveler mike touched on this it is a great way to scope out the landscape and find a nice place to become a permanent place mm-hmm. because you go for a week or two and you're like hey i'm not going back to that place but you go to another place and you'd be like you know maybe i'll stay here longer and before you know it you're like so it's a great way to put your toes in the water mm-hmm. and it, and it's great because if you don't like it you're not there for very long and if you do like it, you, you know what you're getting into. You know, you actually know what it's like to pump cases there. So mm-hmm. the, the positive side to traveling is you really get to see and test out if you ever want to think about changing jobs. Um, I don't know that the, <laughs> the downsides are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty large, but most people have to have a perfect situation to be a traveler. Like Erin just described, she's mm-hmm. able to do it because her home life has everything put together in a certain way where she can go most people they can't do that you know they their their spouse is dug in at their job they can't just keep moving around or they have kids that are too Mm -hmm. little or whatever Mm -hmm. and in my case my kids are grown and i can pretty much go and and come as i please so i know Mm -hmm. a lot of people i don't know about you aaron but a lot of people come up to me and they really want to talk perfusionists want to talk about how do i do it what's it like and then usually they find out that their lifestyle isn't going to permit it right now that it mm-hmm. maybe yeah, some correct. years down the road they mm-hmm. could think about it but they just can't mm-hmm. be getting up and being in a different town two three weeks out of the month you mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. yeah that is correct yeah. um i have a lot of heart surgeons that are talking about their shortage and how oh, their yeah. caseload is just increasing all these baby boomers are getting older mm-hmm. and there's just so much more of, of a them. demand for them their supply is down and that their caseload is just getting heavier mm-hmm. and that there's more people having procedures and they don't see any like future of a diminished need for perfusion or perfusionists mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well look i mean 
40, okay, I graduated, I graduated from my perfusion training in 1979. That's when I graduated, okay? So I was told not long after I graduated my first job, which was at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee, and this person, I can't remember who it was anymore, but they said, perfusion isn't gonna be around in another 10 years, forget about it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay. So, you know, I worried about it a little bit because I was new, I was young, you know, whatever, but I, I you know, I worried about it, but not, not wasn't preoccupied. Right. 10 years came and went, and I was busier than I ever was. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I think I was wrong. But somebody else told me, in another 10 years, there won't be any perfusion. PTCAs, I think, had just kind of started. Mm -hmm. Gruntzig, the original Gruntzig procedure. Um, perfusion was just gonna be gone. And I was mm -hmm. thinking, you know, of course, I was a little smarter then. And I was like, well, what are you gonna do for valves? What are you gonna do for type one dissections? Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do for, you know, for, for dilated aortic roots? What are you gonna do? I mean, I was like, that doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what are you gonna do for ASDs, VSDs, congenital defects, perfusion, where's it gonna go? So. I you know, didn't really pay that much attention at all. Another 10 years goes by. I'm still busier than I ever mm -hmm. was. And mm -hmm. then somebody else tells me, I have been told four times mm -hmm. <laughs> in 41 years of actually working after, after training right. that perfusion was not gonna be around in another 10 years. Right. And we're still here. I don't think yeah. there is a substitute. Now, John, you brought up a very good point. But before about the ECBO, because I want to talk about that. But where do you see, what, do you, what are you seeing? <clears throat> I'm seeing that there is a, at this point, there's still a relative shortage. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And one of the ones we haven't touched upon, but I'll just real briefly, is uh, a lot of people are looking for that perfect position to be in. And uh, they are transient in their length of stay at a job, they'll get something looking for their chance to find that other place mm -hmm. down the road that they would rather be. Mm -hmm. There's always gonna be those what are considered in a former company that I work for, hard to fill positions mm -hmm. that I think will always run the gamut of not having enough people. Mm -hmm. The places that are lovely and uh, I guess you know the Colorados of the world the Californias of the world they may not have that much of a problem but other places uh, not too many people want to go to uh, Anchorage Alaska or dreary Erie or dreary Erie or places like that so mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to depend on, on where the account is as to whether or not it, it historically has uh, people a shortage of people mm -hmm. uh, Getting back to what 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 you were actually asking me though is uh, I and, and once again the question exactly was I want was, to answer where do you see the staffing going where do you see our where do you see the shortage is it getting worse staying the same think, getting better I think it's it's or reducing short right now uh, I think as Aaron might have uh, alluded to that we're starting to see a slight shift for the graduation of the classes. Uh, we're still looking for somebody, I believe, yes. here locally in Houston. We are. And uh, you also have to have a, put another variable on that. Uh, a lot of times you can get a perfusionist, but are they a good perfusionist? Mm -hmm. You know, the good ones are really hard to find. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. good long-term dedicated ones are almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there'll always be positions for guys of, of my age, uh, although you told me I can't retire, I'm gonna have to retire one day. <laughs> I'm just gonna be too old to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's gotta be somebody come along take, to take my spot. You can retire when, after I retire. Okay, we'll talk I about get to that. go first. Okay, you, right. can, you can go yeah. first. I'm senior. So, and John, you talked about the ECMO, but first, let me, let me ask you, Aaron, uh, uh, I want to add to that too. You're married, you have teenage kids, your husband works from home, and you're traveling away on the road. What Correct. kind of a strain does that put on your relationship, if any? 
Well, you have to flip that same coin, Joe, um, because the benefits can also be great um, depending. So being away can be hard and there can be a strain, but if you know you have to be home for something, mm -hmm. then you know that you can schedule, make your own schedule, and that you can be there for all the important things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's a, it's a double-edged sword or just two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's strain. I think it's easier now than perhaps a decade or two ago um, with the video chatting. And I get to see, you know, my children every day and talk to them and, you know, help with their math homework, um, you know, all through video chatting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, And then when... You know, I need to be at something and it means a lot to them, then I make sure I'm there. Same for my husband. If something comes up with him, with my family, mm -hmm. then you have that flexibility where you can take the time off. Mm -hmm. So um, there are strains, mm -hmm. but uh, nothing in life is easy. And there's a lot of benefits as well. I was always stuck at places where we had no coverage. We couldn't plan a vacation. I've had countless vacations canceled because we couldn't get anyone in to relieve me. Um, I missed everything for my kids. I couldn't schedule a day off. And that's my kids' memories yep. from their, their childhood up to this point. So it's difficult when I'm on the road for long periods of times. But then when I'm home, I'm 100% at home with my family, with my kids, and mm -hmm. with my husband. So um, it has its benefits. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, that, I think that ultimately, because I, I, I am very sensitive to what you said, um, I missed every, I missed so many, so many Christmases I can't count. Mm. I missed Me too. all of the, <laughs> the, 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 the little um, concerts that they would do at school. I missed, yeah. I missed everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I, regret it i regret it however and i think you'll have the same experience the kids as they grew up and kind of understood life from a different perspective respected it they yeah. they 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 regretted it too mm -hmm. but they understood why they mm -hmm. didn't have that sense of you weren't here for me because you were there you were just doing what you had to do to make sure that they had what they needed and wanted. That's the luxury of life. Mm. Everything comes Absolutely. at a cost, right? But, you know, but ultimately I, you know, I, I frankly, I, I regret it. I think that I, I, it, I had this thing in my head. I wanted to be the best of, of the best perfusionist in the world. And to do that, I had to always do another case to prove, prove, prove that to myself or whatever it may be. And that was stupid. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, you, you come out of school thinking that way, but then it's, all of a sudden you meet a very special person in your life, and you said, "Now my efforts have changed. I want to be the the best husband I can ever be." Mm -hmm. And then when you have that child, you say, "I want to be the best father I can ever be." And uh, you know, you you uh, you start thinking differently ab about your your commitment to the perfusion. It's still there, and you give it your all. But getting away from it is so important uh, mm -hmm. to have a normal life. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the things with my daughter, I was able to see. I only had one child, so that helps. You didn't have to split between two things like you have to do, Aaron. Uh, but my wife missed out on a heck of a lot, mm -hmm. and I owe her a lot. Mm -hmm. to, I'm going to have a lot to make up to her in the last you know, 25 years of my life. Yeah. And so that's what I'm planning on doing. And so that's why I got to retire, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Retire, retire, uh, retire with the lifestyle that um, we all want. Yeah, right. We all exactly. Want, yeah. that's so sure. I, I get that. Yeah. But uh, so, John, ECMO and Aaron, you can go in on this, too, because you do. I'm sure you do ECMO shift relief. And that's yes. I'm assuming that is a not insubstantial part of your practice. Is that you think that's accurate? I, I wasn't sure. Yes. And I yes. think ECMO is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, John, <clears throat> given I know that of two two small towns just in the last week that I got a call from, they're trying to put together a pool of ECMO perfusionists that they can call if and when they launch their program. Mm -hmm. Small towns. 
but they um, have but they have perfusionists in town. Uh, I, I guess. I, I mean, I would hope yeah, so. I guess so. Must be a heart program that's expanding into ECMO, and their right. perfusionists have said, you better find people to cover it when you do, because we can't. I, I guess that's what's going on, because there's two, two programs that I got notified of in small towns that uh, they want to launch an ECMO program, start doing ECMOs, and they're already calling out months ahead of time. Let's get a list of people that we can call that can cover this if we if we do this. So apparently they don't have their perfusion staff and plan, planning on not doing a whole lot of it. But the reimbursements are tremendous. The cases are everywhere. The flu, you name it, um, are everywhere. Yeah, and there's all kinds the of infectious diseases. Vaping. Stuff. Now there's Valley. You know, uh, vaping associated mm -hmm. lung injury, right. uh, which is a diagnosis. I didn't even know that. Yep. A new diagnosis. Yeah. And these kids are using this. I mean, that's you know, I think I think acute pulmonary dysfunction failure yep. is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're going to have to learn which diseases um, are reversible, right. what's not reversible, when should we use the ECMO, mm -hmm. when should we not use the ECMO, and all of that will have to vet itself out over time. But in the short term, ECMO usage is still growing. Mm -hmm. It is outpacing our yeah. ability to train people. Yes. And yeah. so this is going to be, maybe it's going it, to, it is, it is antithetical to what I used to believe and probably in, you know, I don't know. And some people get very upset when I say this, but wouldn't it make more sense? And I want both of y'all's opinions and yours too. Mm -hmm. And don't hold back. Okay. Just give it to me how you feel. But wouldn't it make more sense for that program that is expanding into ECMO, where the perfusionists say, you better find some people that are gonna be able to come in here and watch this because we don't have enough people to do that. Mm -hmm. And ECMO is so, you know, if uh, inconsistent, it's, it's hot and cold, hot and cold. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's hard to say, we're gonna hire two more perfusionists for this department because we're gonna have all these ECMOs and then you don't have ECMOs for three months or four months, mm -hmm. and then you end up having to let somebody go, mm -hmm. and that's very disruptive. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it just make more sense to have a blended program? You're in a smaller town, you got a perfusion program. They're very qualified to be able to do the insertion, get the patient stable, and then train the nurses to monitor the ECMO. But put them through an actual nurse ECMO specialist training course, not just teaching them, you know, oh, you just do this and this. I mean, that I'm talking about doing it more formally right. and then have a blended program where you oversee it, you do the insertions, you do the change outs, mm -hmm. you do rounds on it, you know, maybe once a day or once a shift or whatever it may be, twice a day, whatever you have phones, FaceTime, it works, you just said it yourself, you know, you, you connect with your family. Um, you know, that's what I think, because I don't really believe that we can fill all of the positions that will be needed to cover all of the ECMO for a three month window, because what do you do with the rest of the time? And so it, from a market perspective, that's very mm. difficult. Staffing is very, very oh. complex when it comes to ECMO. Yeah. It's one of our biggest, biggest problems. Mm -hmm. So John, you first. The yeah, you hit on a big thing. Um, I mean, you have a lot of accounts that they do an ECMO every now and then. I just came from a, uh, not a small town, but a medium sized town. They called me for ECMO and I asked, well, how many have you guys done? Well, we don't really have them, you know, all that often. I, I go, you know, eight a year, yeah, something like that. So you're, you're talking about a lot of, a lot of downtime for whoever's mm -hmm. covering that. And is that person going to sit around or are you just going to keep calling outside people and piecing it together with the perfusionists with some outside help, which is what a lot of places scramble and try to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a complicated one when it comes to staffing because it, it can be so inconsistent. Um, yeah. yeah, and if you want a and, good program, you need the same people, mm -hmm. you know, to have that continuity. 
you got a new perfusionist yep. coming in every time you have an ECMO, there's no continuity from one patient to the next. Mm -hmm. You're not building upon your program. Yeah, I mean, your, your, your CCM physicians aren't seeing it all that often. The nurses see, see the ECMO, you know, not all that often. Maybe it's different nurses the last time because they assignment or they've left. And, you know, I don't know what the answer is. We, the ECMOs that I'm seeing are, are they're getting more, a little more complicated, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they're getting like problems that we see sometimes mm -hmm. getting more complicated with what's really going on with the patient the combination of the ventilator settings with the ECMO, the, the different cannulations for VV, you can have so many different arrangements. Mm, very when exotic I, cannulations we have now. When I just left had femoral vein right IJ, which are shooting right at each other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how much mixing was going on? Um, Do you have an ultimeter have, yet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was did you get great. one of the meters? I didn't have an SVO2 monitor. No, I didn't did have you? an SVO2 monitor, so I couldn't even tell what the SVO2 was. No, but did the, you get the... Uh, the and the incoming line. Did you get the so, Elsa meter yet? Uh, oh, they they declined it. <laughs> they declined it. Yeah. It's oh my crazy. goodness. We well, we did it the other day. We've had another patient, and we did. Are you familiar with the Elsa meter, um, uh, Aaron? No. Oh, I'll tell you about so. it. Okay, so so what's your view on it? How do you feel about what I said, and then what John echoed? With the, the staffing issues yes, associated in terms with of ECMO, I training think, nurses to be ECMO specialists. I think on in community based hospitals where they're putting them on and getting them out, um, I think it should be perfusionists because those are a lot of the crash and burn cases, mm -hmm. and it is all the they don't have a, a pulmonologist if it's VV they don't have an intensivist you know the surgeons aren't available, they're trying to sleep because they have a big case in the morning. Mm -hmm. I think in those scenarios, I feel like it's best that perfusionists, you know, keep hold of the reins. Mm -hmm. um, as you get into larger institutions where ECMO is more mainstream and everyone is comfortable with those very sick patients and getting sicker patients, mm -hmm. um, and it makes sense for the program to train specialists. I mean, as long as it's okay with the state and the licensing and mm -hmm. whatever else, um, mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with how it is across state lines um, in capabilities, but mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, training nurses, respiratory therapists um, to help is, is fine. You know, if it's more mainstream, at that particular hospital, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's it's a little bit less of the the critical thinking, a little bit less of the troubleshooting. Patients are a little bit more stable. There's a lot of other advanced practitioners that are familiar mm -hmm. with the patient care, mm -hmm. and and I think that provides a little bit stronger of a safety net in case something should fall thick fall through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think that, you know, I, you know, my, my opinion is that, you know, if the patient is stable, once you have the v, VV, it works, everything looks good, uh, oxygenation goes up, you know, you get the vent down to rest settings, you know, and the patients, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, we spend a lot of hours, hours. at the bedside mm -hmm. yeah. doing nothing. Okay, really, I mean, doing nothing. Um, you know, if you're having to make all of those adjustments on a continuous basis, well, that's a pretty unstable patient. It's pretty unusual mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Um, usually those cases don't last that long, so you don't need to do anything mm -hmm. when you're having to make that much, that many decisions on an ECMO, because mm -hmm. usually it goes in, they get stable and you're on cruise control until something either happens or you're going to make a change. Mm -hmm. So the ELSA meter, let me tell you about this. It's a little monitor, very easy to use, has two flow probes that are connected, you know, as, as into one. And it plugs in, you put one flow probe on the outlet of your oxygenator, uh, just far enough away so that you're out of the turbulent flow zone. And then you put the other one on the access line as close to the patient as you can. 
now this is for either VA or VV it doesn't make any difference but for VV that's how the setup would be and you're what you're looking at actually for both you set the setup is the same but it does two measurements in VV it measures the intra oxygenator blood volume so if your oxygenators blood volume the the primary volume on is 220 cc's let's just say mm -hmm. and you have 160 cc's in it you have eight you know what's that 60 cc's of space has been occupied by something it's probably not styrofoam or hamburger buns it's more than likely going to be clot that's about the only thing that it could be so you gives you a notification that your oxygenators volume is decreasing because you're developing clot and taking up that space. So that's the first thing that it does. And it does that for VV or VA. With VV, it also measures the amount of recirculation in your either single or double cannulation technique. Doesn't make any difference, but it tells you how much recirculation there is, and then it gives you an effective therapeutic flow. So if you're flowing 4.8 liters, and you have 15% recirculation, your effective flow is gonna be somewhere around 4,000. Mm -hmm. So that's really good. But if you have 46% recirculation mm -hmm. and you're flowing 4.8, and you're wondering why you can't turn the vent down, mm -hmm. it may very well be that that cannula position is not optimal and an adjustment could be made. You should do it at baseline as soon as you go on ECMO you should, if it's mm -hmm. VV, you check it for, if it's VA, you don't do anything, obviously, but VV, do a measurement, get your baseline oxygenator blood volume, make sure that that correlates to what the, uh, the MFU says, and then you get that recirculation percentage, and then when you go to the ICU, you check it again, and, well, you can, of course, if the, if the position needs to be changed, you're right there to do it before mm -hmm. it gets secured. But then you also check it when you get to the ICU to see if during transport something got moved. You just never know. Right. So it's a really neat tool. It's made by Transonic. So I'm going to give them a free advertisement. Transonic yeah. ELSA meter, E L S A. Really good tool <laughs> to have, I think. Okay, so let's. I think we're about. Uh, yeah, we went a little further than I thought we were going to go. I can't thank you guys enough for having done this, Mike. I always love to see you. Um, and I've really enjoyed having you here, uh, Aaron. It's, it's been a real privilege. And John, of course, you know, it's just always good to see you and uh, had a great time. And, I, you know, I miss you. And I wish I could have come there and done some of these cases with you. Or I wish you could have been here because I got some really good tequila ready to, <laughs> ready to go. So, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But, um, but with that said, you know, Aaron, would like to have you back and maybe, you know, talk about some lectures you might like to give or you know any kind of since you do like to teach we are or share your knowledge and i think your cv speaks for itself um you certainly have the bona fides uh would love to consider maybe some lectures you may want to give and uh we can tailor a program around that and uh and encourage you to do it so i'd really like for you to consider that because you have been a true pleasure and uh and your skype has been perfect you're actually really seem you seem much more capable than john much more <laughs> john's got he's all over the map he's got the blurry background though i gotta say you did good on that john you got the blurry background you got the special camera and i'm proud yes, of you for that, that that's my Key West puzzle, 2,500 piece coil reef puzzle. I was hoping to show you, but I guess the glare, the glare made it uh, fuzzy off the light. Oh, you think that's what it is? I don't think that's what it is. I think you have your camera setting to blur the background, which you can oh, do. Okay. Yeah, but that's, that's an advanced feature. Aaron could probably show you how to fix that later. So, okay. so with that said, uh, everybody, anybody have any, any last things they would like to say? Erin? Just thank you for the opportunity. It was a pleasure to officially meet you, Joe ah, and Mike. And I'm a lot, John, I'm a lot nicer a in person. Thank you very much. Thank you too. John, anything? Last thoughts? Thanks a lot, Joe. I'm going to be calling in on your upcoming sessions about the uh, cases I'd like to forget. And also, you might want to mention to Erin 
the the woman in perfusion seminar oh, yes. that you guys are doing. Yes. Ah, um, I would love there that. Is, yes, in uh, in Mar March 28th, if you go to perfweb.com, you'll see that uh, our Stephanie, the girl that's the manager here, um, she uh, came to me and said, hey, I'd really like to do this women in perfusion thing. I found this really neat Facebook page. It's run by, um, I can't think of her first name now, but uh, Trifoletti, I don't know her, but uh, she seems very nice. I'll have an opportunity to meet her. She's gonna come here actually. Um, and uh, so, you know, I was like, yeah, that sounds like a really interesting, yeah, yes, sure, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so she did ask me if I would be part of the program and that way, so there's somebody there to mansplain things. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, I think it would be really good for you to participate in this program. Take a look at it. Go to perfweb.us and look. Absolutely. But for the folks out there that are watching, so on the, tw on the tw March 12th, I'm doing the cases I wish I could forget. And I'm sure there'll be other people here that could talk about their cases. Um, then on the 26th, it's the things I love and hate about the perfusion profession. And uh, that's just a short program, but I think I've got some thoughts about how I feel. What I, there are things I definitely love, there's things I definitely hate. Um, and then on Saturday is the women in perfusion session. And uh, there's the unique challenges facing women in perfusion, the history of women in perfusion. And Ann Greco is gonna be giving that talk. And you know, Ann is, uh, I think uh, treasurer of the board, uh, the, the ABCP board uh, 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 treasurer, and then starting a family as a perfusionist is going to be uh, Stephanie because she did that. Mm -hmm. So that I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, program. Mm -hmm. I, I agreed. So we're looking forward to seeing you there. <laughs> sounds wonderful. Okay. I'll be in touch. All right, sounds good. All right, any last thoughts? Keep on pumping. Keep on pumping. That's it. That's right. Keep on pumping. That's right. Blue blood in, red blood, red blood out. out. That's right. And don't drain the out. Don't drain the don't reservoir. Don't run dry. Don't run it dry. <laughs> that's it. I mean, really, that's all we do. You know. I mean, Cooley said it right. Give me enough. Give me enough bananas. I can teach a monkey how to run that pump. <laughs> but he added to that and said, "But I can't teach the monkey to think." See, that was the issue. And he was. He was. He was. He was being sarcastic but yet at the same time complimentary mm -hmm. in the same breath so uh, but that was his that was how he was that was his persona was okay me. everybody thanks very much for being here love everybody we're looking forward to seeing you on thursday march 12th and then 26th and 28th john thank you aaron thank you mike thank you very much always a pleasure always. we'll see you next time The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 
So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. And you're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the Wrap Venous Cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today.